What's up, you cool cats? Thanks for thanks for coming over to the Patreon uh, today. We're gonna talk about um, we're gonna talk about another cool cat who was uh, gone way too soon. His mm. name was um, Kurt Cobain. Kurtless Cobain. Right, guys. Yeah. What's that? Oh, I just wanted to make his name longer. Oh, make it a little more official. Yeah, we're gonna have to add a lot of syllables on this episode because I don't have any notes. Um, but yeah, but you I know got notes. about. I mean, okay. I could, I could, yeah. I could just talk about this I, the entire time. Yeah, yeah I know Sean right. could talk about it the entire time too. Uh, we're obviously going to get to his death, but Sean, yeah. yeah, you're from Seattle. I am from Seattle. Mm-hmm. Yes. What does Kurt Cobain mean to you? Mm-hmm. Uh, Kurt Cobain means something to everybody because mm-hmm. we're white guys who grew up in a certain time. Mm-hmm. Kurt Cobain was like the last time Seattle was like nationally relevant. I mean, like I guess. What we had Macklemore since then, yeah, but that's not anything anybody would uh, be jealous of. Yeah, but he had a nice little run there for a second. Yeah, in like 2013, you know. Yeah, Everybody then he like, won. Well, he won a Grammy for like you know rap album of the year, mm-hmm. and then he said that Kendrick should have won it, won. and then everyone, and then Kendrick was like, "You, you just win. You don't say I should have won it." Yeah, and then it was a, it's yeah, like, "What? Well, I was trying to be nice," uh-huh, and then everyone yeah. made fun of me for not, you know. Yeah, it was a real lose lose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he just kept taking L's. He was like, "When I was thirteen, I thought that I was gay. <laughs> yeah, but I'm actually not gay. Yeah, but and that sucks. That it's not the worst. Yeah, but it's so easy to laugh at. Yeah, and of course we're going to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. This is hip hop, baby. Right. Well, it's so on <laughs> the should... nose. It's like having a song called "Racism Is Wrong." Mm-hmm. Well, it's very like Katy Perry firework, but it, you're rapping and you're mm-hmm. a man. Mm-hmm. And so we're going to laugh at you. Yeah. He did have a nice costume, though, at that one concert. Yeah. That he oh, got what canceled was it? for. He oh, dressed he up as like the Jewish merchant. He had like oh, the yeah. giant yeah. nose. He dressed- Why did he Why do he, that? Yeah, what was that about? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> was it thrift shop? He put, oh my God. It was that the thrift shop song? I'm right. going to think so, yeah. Cash. He dressed up like. big first song. He dressed up like yeah. Sam Cooke's manager who had him killed. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, he's like, he's like, and I just want to say that that you know, exploitation in the music industry is a big problem. Yeah. That's why I'm dressed up like a Hasidic Jew. Dressed like a. He thought he it was really going to be like, like a, yeah, like a yeah. party city pimp. Yeah. yeah. You ever see that uh, clip of Kelly Osbourne on The View, and she goes, she's talking about Trump, and she Who? goes, "Who's going to clean your toilet?" <laughs> oh, that's not. No. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah, everybody well, I, I didn't mean it like like that. Like, well, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. You could, and it's so funny because she thought that. Yeah. They were, they were gonna go nuts. Yes. Liberalism. Yes! Yeah, her, her, her <laughs> face. They clean toilets. That's right. That's right, Kelly. She, Facts, girl. We need a slave class. <laughs> yes. <laughs> she she practiced that line hundreds of times. In hundreds the mirror, of and times. She nailed yeah. it, and the yeah. look on her face after she says it is like. Mm-hmm. Fuck yeah! I did it exactly did it. the way I wanted to do mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she thought she ate, as the kids say. She thought mm-hmm. she ate, and she probably did eat a lot. That day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if she's mind. still eating, in fact, she's probably still eating. <laughs> my sister Caitlin liked like you know punk rock music and stuff yeah. as a kid. Yeah, and um, so my mom bought her a uh, bobbleheads of the Osborne family. Uh-huh. And she's like, "That's not what this is." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was like Jack Osborne's <laughs> fat head. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> she she got it at TJ a- Maxx. It was like Mark. <laughs> down a bunch of yeah, times yeah. yeah um i i, I want to do just i want to do a little bit of research because we can all i think we should all go around the room and, and and talk about uh i don't know we should talk we should talk about this guy's life i watched a video today it, it was like five bands that kurt cobain hated and uh kurt cobain because he loved music so much he would like talk shit about bands well, also because he he's like, a young man it wasn't just yeah. that it was like he was a kid yeah uh-huh. and when you're a kid you talk shit about the things you don't like yeah well kevin brennan talks shit Right, the things he doesn't yeah, like. Oh, sure. Kurt Cobain was like Speaking the Kevin Speaking of guys who just shot themselves <laughs> in the face at 27. <laughs> but Kurt Cobain was like the Kevin Brennan of uh, music, you know? Like, he would do these interviews and he'd be like, these 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 guys suck because this is, you know, right. this is why these guys well, suck. Well, Kurt Cobain was like Kevin uh, Brennan because uh, Kurt Cobain lost his virginity to a retarded woman. And mm-hmm. Kevin Brennan lost it to Sarah Silverman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they were right. both on MTV in 1992. <laughs> yeah, actually, she lost her virginity. You're right. Yes. But yeah, revert. Funny, you know. I um, but I mean, did you? So the bands that he hated. Oh yeah. Was yeah. uh in in this in this video? It's uh it's uh ACDC, Led Zeppelin, uh, Guns and Roses, and uh, and Pearl. Jam. He didn't like Pearl Jam for some reason, which is kind of interesting. Baloney. Yeah. Why? 
he thought that uh, Eddie Vedder, he said, he said, Eddie Vedder's a nice guy. Uh, I've never had a problem with him, but he's like, I think he thought he was like too committed to the grunge movement. Hmm. Like he thought he was too like rigid. And, he was like, Eddie, was... have you tried heroin? You seem a little too <laughs> focused on your career. Yeah. Yeah. Now, how do you, how do you, uh, define the grunge movement? Cause everything is like a response, a response to something else. Right. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. At the very, yeah. So, I mean, I think grunge music to like me, Donald Trump was a response to Obama and then, and then Donald Trump's going to be a response to Joe Biden and so, in a couple of years. So you're saying grunge music was a, a response to maybe pop music. Michael Jackson was on the top of the charts. Well, um, hair metal, hair metal, hair saying. metal too. Um, <laughs> Paul Abdul was on top of the show. I love having sex. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well jump. My dick feels so good. <laughs> There's also with grunge is is that judgment of hair metal yeah. um, is shit. They're not talking about anything. Mm-hmm. It is all about getting laid yeah, or yeah. having fun. Yeah. And you know, there's guy David Lee Roth brags about how, you know, all of my songs are about having fun. It's yeah. what, it's right, what my right. songs are. Right. Totally allowed. Also totally the songs allowed, yeah. fucking kick dick. Yeah, yeah. Um and you know, that doesn't negate I mean Van Halen is one of the greatest bands ever. Mm-hmm. Certainly better live performers than Nirvana, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, certainly well, better definitely at their, now <laughs> at their instruments than mm-hmm. um Nirvana. Mm-hmm. But what Kirk Cobain was able to do with what he had is bigger than I think anything yeah. that is Bon Jovi hair metal? Yeah, for yeah. sure. In my opinion at least. Yeah. yeah. Um I'm because f- I follow uh, David Bryan on uh Instagram because his daughter is a comic. David Bryan's in Bon Jovi. I think he's the drummer for Bon Jovi. Um but when when the Queen died everybody was like, Yeah you fucking colonizer bitch. Breast in piss, you fucking whore. But then he had a post where he was like, R. I. P. to the Queen. She was awesome. <laughs> I thought that was very funny. Do you know but, why he uh, hated Zeppelin? I wonder why he hated yeah. Zeppelin. I um he hated Zeppelin because he said that he didn't like the way that they um they talked about women. He was like very like uh, anti. Uh, They're yeah. building a stairway to a thirteen-year-old groupie. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, Jimmy Page abducted well, that, like a sixteen-year-old, right? Yeah, yeah. Stairway to Heaven. It was originally called Stairway to the Basement, where a fourteen-year-old is chained up. <laughs> but then they were like, "What if we did? What if we changed it? Yeah. They'll, they'll know to <laughs> check if, in the basement. <laughs> tell them to go up. <laughs> maybe up maybe heaven. Maybe <laughs> heaven. Yeah." <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> They'll all look in heaven. <laughs> it's the the stairway to that child hooker you killed. <laughs> yeah. Well, Nirvana had that song "Arrow Zeppelin," uh, which is Aerosmith and Led Zeppelin. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And he said, uh, "Yeah, let's just throw together some heavy metal riffs in no particular order and give it a quirky name and homage to a couple of our favorite masturbatory '70s rock acts." But he was quick mm-hmm. to point out that it wasn't actually about Aerosmith or Led Zeppelin. Uh huh. He said it was more about the cheap knockoffs that follow those bands. Right. He said it's about the cult, Faster Pussycat, King right. of Come, Guns N' Roses, White Snake, and Nirvana. Yeah. Yeah. Because the 80s, when you think about it, were, it was very like vapid and, uh, you know, just boomer like. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. It was, and MTV just, took off at the same time. And so it's very much just like party, young people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah it, just, it just took over. We have sex with yeah. a lot of girls. W- way more than the. The content people were, you know, it seemed like this was about getting laid and getting yeah. drunk and doing drugs. Yeah. Um, and then Nirvana, obviously, a response where they strip away even some of the good things we like about those things, where it's like the songs are simpler to play. Uh-huh. Um, I think that's like when people try to shit on Nirvana, it's like, well, they're simple pop songs. Yeah, simple pop songs are really hard to fucking write. Mm-hmm. Um, they're definitely pop songs. That's Nirvana's pop songs? Nirvana's pop songs. So Kurt Cobain was inspired by Pixies, and the Pixies, yeah, it's like punk rock grunge music, but they're writing, it's it's very short and sweet, very Mm -hmm. to the point, Mm -hmm. uh, repetitive, easy to translate, Mm -hmm. and Kurt Cobain was more inspired by Pixies than anybody, at least what he claims. Right. What what do you think are the poppiest Nirvana songs? Um... I mean, I think it smells like Teen Spirit is a pop song. I think All Apologies is like a ballad. I mean, that's a ballad if I've ever heard one. Um, what are In Bloom? In Bloom, yeah. Penny Royal T is a pop song. I mean, that's a Beatles song. Penny Royal T sounds like you're ma- you're joking about what a Beatles so- lyrics would be. Um, 
Oh, another band. He- They're undeniably he's a pop hit writer. I mean, he to he doesn't understand music enough. He could only make pop hit. It, um, it's a good thing, you know. Mm-hmm. It's like the way who yeah. was it? Patton Oswalt talks about uh, Dave Attell, mm-hmm. where you hear it and it's like, oh, this almost sounds easy to create because it's just yeah. so boom, boom, boom. And silly. But then try to write a fucking Beatles right. song. You can't. That's yeah. why. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nobody makes Beatles money. It, 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 it's a skill that's like very difficult. Right. To and Kurt, Kurt referred to his music as children's songs. Yeah. Oh, did he? So there you yeah. go. Yeah. It's like very and there's a. All of those artists that are like you know, bigger uh, than the music, it's that shit. It's somehow the, it's like it's very low level. Hey, all I had was what I wanted to say, right? And then they found a way to fucking say it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting because Chuck Berry also called his music children's songs. <laughs> <laughs> also, he called bathrooms in his property children's <laughs> bathrooms. Dude, you have to just. I can't stop thinking about that. You have to just admire the commitment. <laughs> to be in a pervert, like he really only like they had a meeting. They were like, "Chuck, we're thinking about changing our meat supplier." <laughs> and in his head, he's just like, "He's like, yeah, let me ask you something. What about the toilet?" <laughs> he's just having to do the day to day. Yeah, he has to like yeah. change the board every mm-hmm. day. God damn it. Yeah, yeah. He's just like looking over payroll, but just like <laughs> thinking about the bathroom cameras, <laughs> just in the back of his mind. Every like actual thing he has to do for the restaurant, it's just like I can't wait to get back to the office and look at those bathroom cameras. He just uh, he, the menu is just things that make you shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Things that make you rat. Right, right, right. It's all just queso and, and uh... <laughs> it's chili. Yeah, Chuck, Chuck Berry opened up a Taco Bell franchise. <laughs> yeah, so that he could film women shit in the bathroom. Do you have Pepsi? No, we have smooth move uh, tea. <laughs> Chuck, Chuck, Chuck Perry's house of kale and just heavy cream. <laughs> <laughs> it's just all cream spinach. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, Territorial another... Pissing is a great song. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's such a good song. I love that shit. Yeah. What's what was it was interesting? Another band that Kirk Cobain hated, uh, the Grateful Dead. He hated hippies because See, he this thought is just that... kid shit, man. He's got kid brain. Well, he didn't like hippies because he felt that hippies had given up and weren't trying to make the world a better place. Oh, when did he say this? Twenty six, and then what yeah. did he do at twenty seven? <laughs> Speaking of giving up. <laughs> on a movement Kurt? It is, well, um, that's what we're going to get into. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, John Potash is the guy who wrote this book, Drugs as Weapons Against Us, which I haven't read, but I wrote, uh, watched the two-hour documentary based on it. It's on YouTube. I'll, we'll link it in the description for this, Drugs as Weapons Against Us. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that this guy, John Potash, alleges is that the Grateful Dead were like a CIA connection to distribute LSD throughout the country. Hmm. Yeah, um, I've heard of this. Yeah, because the CIA bought up the, all, the entire LSD supply in the 1950s, mm-hmm. and then and, you know, uh, not too long thereafter, the dead emerge. And um, <clears throat> wasn't one of their managers also like, uh, yeah, yeah, the son of a CIA guy or something? Yeah, yeah, there's a there's some connections, but it was to I, stop the anti war movement. Well, um, drugs is weapons against us. He talks about Kurt and Courtney, and some of my evidence for this episode, I will I'll cite it when I am citing him. But he his, his big argument is essentially that, yes, drugs, uh, whether it's like heroin or cocaine or LSD were brought in by the uh, CIA and various al- arms of the U.S. government, um, primar- or not primarily, but at least one of the w- reasons they were doing that was to um, uh, control the counterculture, mm-hmm. to make sure that any sort of youthful rebellion of the 60s and 70s was just, you know, hedonism, drugs, free love and sex. Mm-hmm. Like, just, like, focus on the self, you mm-hmm. know, the century of self or timothy leary or whoever whatever you said tune in turn on drop out yeah Um, yeah i just think san francisco right there's like proof that the feds were in san fran um making sure everybody was losing their minds a little more than they should have been yeah there were like uh it tom o'neill's book chaos he talks about there were cia because you know the fbi program was cointel pro the cia program was chaos and these were both entirely illegal but nothing was ever nobody was was on paper called chaos yeah operation chaos Uh, um but uh but anyways the the cia program they did have like deep cover cia people who would just get paid to just do drugs and hang out with hippies and like have long hair which Mm -hmm. seems like one of the best government jobs you could get yeah just get like free health care and retire at 60 with a cop's pension (laughs) after you just spent like 20 years just getting chlamydia from like ladies at woodstock and (laughs) 
Now, don't you think so much uh, like a part of that movement, right, in San Francisco where it's like Jefferson Airplane and stuff, um, the reason they got so good is also the drugs. So the CIA is giving these people drugs that obviously anybody who has taken them admit they open up really uh, powerful creative gateways. Mm -hmm. It's obviously why the music made such a radical change at that time. It's because these people are doing drugs and something is opening in them that's creating this noise, right? Right. Um, You're saying we should do acid before we do a podcast? Yeah. One, day and just see one of the that, times, like, We should yeah, do an, sure, an acid always, episode yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah, that should definitely happen. Um, <laughs> but, you know, what, so, so <laughs> do they also know, oh, but it'll only go so far? I mean, because what drugs did, that counterculture is so massive that it affects today. I mean, people can even go like, oh, the fashion or whatever. Mm -hmm. Why would the CIA want that part of it that the drugs well, obviously yeah. contributed to? The idea is like, yeah, the counterculture, you know, it shocked people and it, it changed some stuff in terms of our attitudes towards sex and drugs and birth control and all that. But the actual structures of the economy, the actual structures of the war machine, none of that was ever impacted. And, you know, it is interesting because people say the Grateful Dead's a CIA band. They also say that about the Doors because Jim Morrison's dad was on the Gulf of Tonkin ship, which was yeah. the, huh. the false flag they did to start the Vietnam War. Right. And it's like maybe they're CIA bands, but I actually think they're both like great. I like both of them, you the did. Dead and the Doors. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, the CIA and whole Courtney Love's band before she killed her bassist. Mm -hmm. We'll get to that. But Oh, yeah. I didn't I didn't even realize that. Yeah. <coughs> she she died, huh? Yeah. Cor now, oh wait, now Courtney Love. I just think Courtney Love's father was the Grateful Dead's manager. Can mm -hmm. we look that up? That's true. Yeah, he Courtney was. Love's father oh. was the Grateful Dead's. See, manager. that's the thing, yeah. and you know, like I guess now we're just getting into the Kurt, unless there's anything else about. Well, I, I just, I, I kind of feel bad shitting on Kurt because I do love Kurt Cobain. I mean, I think we're all after peak Nirvana, right? We were little kids when I was four years old when yeah, Kurt yeah, died. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there is a moment in middle school, if you would all get into music, mm -hmm. where you find out about Nirvana and a lot of things change. And yep. that allows you to find out about other music. Yeah. I think Kurt Cobain is like essential in learning about types of music. Sure. I think he's like a gateway. Yeah. Mm. I, I feel like I kind of missed it, too, because cause I, I think the 90s is like such a great decade for music like there's nothing like it and there's the early 90s like all the all the grungy stuff and then there's like the late 90s where it gets like a little more fun you know i, I don't know when return which of is Mac. a response to kurt when kurt died everyone was there's a lot of one hit wonders and it was just like let's throw every band at the wall and who's gonna stick and mm -hmm. nobody was sticking mm -hmm. which is mm. interesting. but like the the late 90s was like you know you had like sugar ray and like yeah. sister hazel yeah well, blues stuff. traveler I love just really, Blues Traveler. It's it's so good. Yeah. I love Blues Traveler. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was I was never like uh yeah, listen to Nirvana when it what about when Nirvana it Unplug. I've I mean, never really like let myself get into it. Yeah. I will say this, Nirvana definitely I and I allowed it to like assisted in the the pieces of me that get depressed easier mm -hmm. than I think a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. Like when I found them, I was going through something and I definitely went this feels like my sadness and therefore I'm allowed to be outwardly sad. Mm. And I was openly kind of negative, not thanks and no thanks to Nirvana. Cause yeah. you are able to express pieces of you that is like, no, I do feel these ways. Yeah. Um, but then, and it is weird cause you watch and now we can get into the murder or mm. suicide is you think of Kurt as this sad person. You think of these songs as sad songs, when you do listen to interviews with Kurt Cobain, he's like one of the most progressive people ever. Mm -hmm. So pro gay, so pro women, so pro civil rights, where everybody at the time is very much like, who gives a fuck about everything? You know, like yeah, yeah. Andrew Dice Clay is the peak of comedy. Right, right. Um, being cruel to people is at its peak in terms of, right, on like a hang level. Right. You know, married with children is on top of the world. And then there's yeah. this musician. Who, yeah, he's sad and, and the band like rocks or whatever you want to say, like throwing it out there on the news. Mm -hmm. But every time he's in an interview, you, you do see that like love child of the 60s where you're like, God damn, this guy really does care about. Um, and he hates bullies. Mm. Yeah. Like there wasn't. Well, he also admitted to having sex with a girl with Down syndrome, though, right? When he was in high school. I don't know. Uh, well, who, he hates whom, bullies. Whom who says, among us? Who says women like that can't consent. <laughs> Who ableist people who <laughs> thinks yeah, cool. Down syndrome women can't make love just just like anyone else. Well, nobody's perfect, you know. Yeah. I think everybody told got, a friend that everybody's he thought got about spots. doing it, but didn't do it. Oh, okay. But who knows? Yeah, well, who hasn't thought about? <laughs> you know, 
<laughs> it is I one of those things that you say, and then when your friends look at you weird, you're like, no, I was just thinking about doing it. I mean, <laughs> I was quoting a Jake Flores bit. <laughs> <laughs> It, it is cool that he talks so much shit about other musicians. I mean, I would love to do that. Like, just every interview, I'm like, Tony Hinchcliffe sucks. <laughs> you but, already do that. Dude, they, oh, yeah, you do it all the time. But, yeah, they bring do up I, all, I don't think they're I like Madonna. Shit it's, uh, Madonna's like $45 a ticket or something. They're like, what? Like, they're like yeah. $45 a t-, You know, they yeah, find yeah, out Metallica yeah. is charging, and they're like, what? Ew. Yeah. yeah. And it's cool to see. Yeah. Um, at the same time, you never know what that would have became eventually. Cause, it's just you know, fun to like the thing. You know, you when you do a thing, you like it, and I don't know. I love it's it's great when you when you're around comics, you can just yeah. talk shit about certain people. He said yeah. Axl Rose wanted to fight him or something at the MTV Awards once, and he's just like, "You're a baby, man." Like yeah, yeah, he's yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like Axl's like making fists at me and stuff. I'm yeah, like, yeah. You wanna fight? <laughs> yeah, he's chilling. Yeah, but I think like with the uh, with the Kurt Cobain death and all that, I think the two main things are. <coughs> I like Tony, by the way. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Uh, the two main things are Kurt was planning to divorce Courtney Love before he died. Mm-hmm. And he also called his lawyer the month before he died, their shared entertainment lawyer, Kurt Cobain, called her and said he wanted Courtney Love written out of his will. He dies in April. Two th- or that's, 19- that's confirmed. Yeah. This is um, <clears throat> in March 1994. He calls this lawyer like right before he goes on stage in Munich. This is his last show, by the way, and says he wants Courtney Love written out of his will. And then in April 1994, he's dead. Mm-hmm. And so because he died without writing her out of his will and without getting a divorce, Courtney Love inherited Kurt Cobain's share or uh, a, a significant part of it of Nirvana's music catalogs, which in 2006, Kurt, uh, Courtney Love sold... 25% of her share of Nirvana's catalog for $50 million. <laughs> according, to inter- according to Entertainment Weekly, uh, she sold it to a uh, former uh, uh, Virgin Records executive named uh, Larry Mestal. So that's $50 million for 25% of her share. So it value be about $200 million. How do you sell 25% of your sh- distributing rights, publishing rights? She, certain songs yeah she sold 25 percent of what she owned yeah okay. she still owns more yeah like in 2006 she sold 25 percent of what she owns mm-hmm. like i think the the majority goes to their daughter francis <laughs> yeah um they're like bidding for each song she's like all right rape me now <laughs> Anyone, can i get a, a 200 dollars for rape me rape me my remember friend that rape show, me again? remember that Chappelle show where it's like uh uh tyrone's four hundred thousand dollar <laughs> crack party it's like courtney loves 50 million dollar heroin party <laughs> Um, but yeah, oh, they, and Courtney and Kurt had a prenuptial agreement. So essentially, like, assuming which I think all the evidence indicates, I don't even think people who you know would call me a conspiracy theorist. I don't think anyone would dispute that Kurt was trying to divorce Courtney. Mm-hmm. Assuming that a divorce went through, mm-hmm. she would have got some money, but she wouldn't have got two hundred million. Yeah, and especially because they had a prenuptial agreement, she would have had to get a lawyer. They would have mm-hmm. fought about it. You know, they would have arrived at some figure. But not two hundred million dollars, which yeah. is what we can value. What Courtney got out of Kurt being dead. Now, why so, would you get a prenuptial? Don't you love and trust your perfect wife? <laughs> your fucking crackhead wife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> your uh, and that's the other thing. Like we were just talking about Courtney loves dad. So that's the second point, or uh, this is the second point. The first point is yeah, because Kurt died, Courtney Love got a bunch of money. And my second point would just be Courtney Love ran with some really shady people. And she was, you know, I think a victim as much as a, as a perpetrator. But it should just like be noted. Uh, we talk a lot about Jeffrey Epstein, the black book, you know, with all the phone numbers of Jeffrey Epstein. This was turned over by Jeffrey Epstein's former house manager, a guy named Alfredo Rodriguez, since dead. Um, uh, Alfredo Rodriguez turned this over to the journalist Nick Bryant, and he's uh, this this uh, black book of Jeffrey Epstein's contacts. And he circled 46 names, uh, or no, 47 names. And he said, and he said those people were, quote, material witnesses, unquote, to crimes against underage girls involving Jeffrey Epstein. And Courtney Love is in that book, and she is one of the few people, few women, that he circled. Hmm. So Courtney Love, like, according to Jeffrey Epstein's house manager, was directly involved in that. And, you know, that's a little weird. But then let's go to her father. And this I'm going from John Potash. 
Uh, he wrote Drugs as Weapons Against Us, but also this is a write-up in Covert Action magazine. We'll link to this in the description. But <clears throat> Courtney Love's father, I'm quoting now, Hank Harrison, was an ex-manager of the Grateful Dead. He stated that he introduced Courtney Love to a man in Dublin named Steve O'Leary who had sex with her when she was 17 years old. And so this is already fucked up where it's like her father's introducing her to some guy who has sex with her at 17. Uh, so that's a little weird. And then just continuing from the quote, uh, O'Leary, um, Steve O'Leary, this guy that uh, Courtney Love slept with uh, when she was 17, uh, O'Leary took Love to England where she brought a thousand hits of LSD to punk and new wave music scenes, distributing the acid to musicians. She would also sleep with many of these musicians and disrupt bands. She repeated this behavior in many American music scenes, handing out many kinds of drugs like ha candy. Her father, Harrison, said that O'Leary, when he was on his deathbed, sent him a letter stating that he had been working for the CIA at the time. Hmm. And, you know, again, you can believe or disbelieve her father, but it's it's a story that adds up with... Uh, um, Melissa Rossi uh, wrote a, a biography of Courtney Love, and she says that uh, uh, she got a letter from Courtney Love's former boyfriend in which Love admitted to uh, prostituting in Taiwan as a teenager. There was a different biography that uh, says that Love worked as a stripper from an organized, for an organized crime family in Japan as part of what she called, quote, the white slave trade. Mm. Uh, there's like, the fuck? She, she was in Alaska for a while. Probably. I would think that's hard to do though. Go to a country, Gump of go to a foreign <laughs> country and <laughs> work as a prostitute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then there's like uh, people don't know what she was doing. Courtney Love was doing in Alaska. She might have been involved in like sex trafficking or whatever there. Mm -hmm. So it's just like a it's a situation where the line between victim and perpetrator kind of gets blurred mm -hmm. because clearly she was like brought into this world when she was. You think under... in Alaska she be guys became Eskimo brothers? <laughs> I don't know. Is that... <laughs> Yeah, I like that. Yeah, yeah, that's good. She made all of uh, Alaska Eskimo brothers. Yeah, but um, but my point is because I know like some of our listeners just call me a uh, conspiracy theorist or whatever, mm -hmm. and you know like maybe I'm just like smoking too much weed or whatever on the Kurt Cobain thing. Mm -hmm. But my point here is like two hundred million dollars. Yeah, she wouldn't have gotten that much money. That's yeah. point one. So, point two is she ran with really shady people. Yeah, she ran with uh, you know, since she was underage. Sex traffickers, all sorts of like weird organized crime people, and drug pushers. Like she was, she and Kurt were full on heroin addicts. Uh, by most all accounts, she's the one who kind of introduced Kurt to heroin or really got him going on heroin. Mm -hmm. And it's so, it's like, okay, if you just hang around like sex traffickers and drug traffickers and they're aware that you're like famous fiance, uh, famous husband who like, is going to leave you mm -hmm. and that would potentially cost you, I don't know, $150 million. Mm -hmm. Like it's not that difficult to imagine a situation where you do know people who could have him killed and you do know people who would very much, even if you were, even if you didn't want to, if you're just like strung out on heroin and you know, all these dealers, there are people who are like, you got to protect your money. You got to get us this money, you know, scary individuals. And I, I th like, I do believe that Kurt Cobain was murdered, and I believe Courtney Love knows more than she's let on. Um, but an operation like that, I don't know. I, I, uh, I don't know if like you can really say Courtney Love murdered Kurt Cobain, but I, I think you can say, yeah, she knows something, and she benefited from it, and people around her were probably the ones who who actually did it. Yeah, so you mentioned that they had a prenup, which is interesting. Because uh -huh. uh, the I watched sort of like a debunking video, and the guy in that sort of argues that like if she wanted his money and she wanted him gone, like she could just she could just wait because he was a he was a heroin addict, but he wanted her out of his will. Well, yeah. Um, so that's the thing. I also watched this documentary that's called Soaked in Bleach. Mm -hmm. It's a film by uh, Benjamin uh, Statler, and it's based on this private investigator named Tom Grant. Because what happens is, uh, on April 3rd, 1994, Courtney Love hires a private investigator, Tom Grant, mm -hmm. uh, to find Kurt. Because mm -hmm. Kurt um, is last seen in Seattle April 2nd, 1994. And then he's not seen again after that. Um, so Courtney Love hires a private investigator to look for him April 3rd, 1994. Kurt's body turns up April 8th, 1994. 
But this private investigator, uh, Tom Grant, he starts recording all, like all of his conversations with Courtney Love, but also with uh, Courtney and Kurt's attorney, Rosemary Carroll, mm-hmm. which is where you know um, uh, how we know that Rosemary Carroll uh, uh, said that Kurt called her and asked about taking um, <coughs> uh, taking Courtney out of the will, and uh, you know other such stuff. Um, but there's like the documentary Soaked in Bleach, which I do recommend people watch if they're kind of skeptical about all this. But it kind of goes through Tom Grant's story and just all the different holes in Courtney Love's timeline and the kind of very weird behavior she exhibits both like before and immediately after uh, Kurt Cobain's death. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, like, you know, I do think it matters also just to talk about Nirvana for a, another second is. We talk about all this angst and grunge music and stuff, but the documentary Soaked in Bleach does mention that 68 people, there are 68 known people who have committed suicide as a copycat of Kurt Cobain. Yeah. Because you listen to that music and you're like so into grunge and you're like, oh, my hero blew his head off with a shotgun. Right. That's really cool and romantic. So 68 people fucking killed themselves over this. And it's like, I think the, uh, the, uh, evidence points towards this actually being a murder not a suicide and i think it does matter to kind of dispel this uh this this notion of kurt yeah. as like a uh those 68 people could have like <laughs> cured cancer or something <laughs> Just kidding. Um, yeah. yeah well because the suicide note um has an extra sentence added at the there's, end yeah, there's like three sentences at the bottom which appear to be in completely different handwriting and another thing is like tom grant says the private investigator that the only reason the public ever saw the suicide note is because he got Courtney to show him a copy. She didn't even say that was the original, but she mm-hmm. showed him a copy, and he's like, can I Xerox this for my records? And mm-hmm. he did. Mm-hmm. So it's a copy of what she says is a copy of the note. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, the in, um, the entire thing is weird. And, like, why do you think she hired him? This is kind of a co- – he says it's a cover-your-ass thing. Yeah. Because, okay – we don't know exactly when Kurt Cobain died, but you know, last seen April second, body found April eighth, had been dead for at least a few days by the time it was found. Um, so it, I guess it's like if you're the wife and you want to kind of uh, establish an alibi, or that you're concerned, yeah. <laughs> but like one of the weirdest things, you don't want to Casey Anthony it and go, uh, you know. <laughs> Party, <laughs> yeah, do a wet T-shirt contest. <laughs> oh yeah, thank God Courtney Love couldn't Google that night, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right. But like one of the weirdest things is, uh, Courtney Love files a missing persons report on Kurt Cobain, but she does it in his mother's name. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, she files this on April fourth, nineteen ninety four, mm-hmm. uh, and the report, the missing persons report, says that uh, Kurt Cobain had run away from a California facility and flew back to Seattle. But, like, very disturbingly, it also says he bought a shotgun and maybe suicidal. But the thing, like, the, the thing is, the fucking shotgun was bought by this other heroin user named Dylan Carson. Who was, like, living with them. Dylan Carlson, excuse yeah, me. Yeah. And Dylan Carlson actually had a tweet. I looked this up in 2012. Uh, or it, I looked this up, and Dylan Carlson has a tweet from, uh, from 2012 where he says... Um, <clears throat> To conspiracy Cobaniacs and Tom Grant groupies, you will not learn anything here. Other than friends, the only person I'd talk to is, and then he tags Lil Wayne's account. Mm -hmm. So he said that back in uh, 2012. Mm -hmm. But uh, the point that the movie makes, Dylan Carlson, who's Kurt Cobain's like, you know, they say close friend, but it's just they were guys who did heroin together. Right. And Dylan Carlson talks about like him and Kurt would just book a shitty motel for two or three weeks and just do heroin nonstop and just survive on, you know, chips and soda and heroin for two or three weeks. And so uh, Dylan Carlson is the guy on March 30th who goes and buys Kurt Cobain the shotgun. And it's, um, I guess it's very weird because uh, uh, Tom Grant kind of says, Essentially, that as soon as Kurt Cobain was dead, Dylan Carlson, still a heroin addict, well, his source of heroin was Kurt Cobain. Kurt Cobain was the guy with money. Mm-hmm. If you're a heroin addict, you need money. Mm-hmm. You know, you're he, he doesn't have a job. He doesn't have any income. He's just relying on his rich friend Kurt to get him the heroin. Now Kurt's dead, and suddenly Courtney Love becomes the person with the money and the heroin connection. Because Tom Grant tells the story of like he wanted to. Uh, do a follow-up interview 
with Dylan Carlson about some of the discrepancies. And so Courtney Love says, yeah, I'll bring him over. Mm -hmm. And she does, but then she takes him upstairs and like shoots him up full of heroin. Mm -hmm. And then when he comes down for the interview, he's just completely nodded out. He can't even answer any of his questions. Mm -hmm. So it just seems like... um, And I guess he's since sober. He hasn't mm-hmm. said anything about it, but it just seems like a situation where as soon as Kurt was dead, all of the power passed to to Courtney. And it's the same kind of thing with the lawyer, mm-hmm. Rosemary Carroll. We mentioned she was the entertainment lawyer for both of them. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, uh, Tom um, Tom Grant, the, the private investigator, was recording her. And so she talks about um, the the suicide note being like a pista- Kurt Cobain suicide note. She and you can hear the recording, she calls it a pistache of different things Kurt Cobain had written. Mm -hmm. You know, like it was like willfully jumbled together. And then she says, Tom, are you recording this? And he he goes, yeah, I record all my phone calls. She goes, oh, shit, come on. You know, or something like that. Courtney said that? No, not Courtney. um, Rosemary Carroll, the entertainment lawyer. Yeah. So it is something where you get this kind of entertainment lawyer who works for both of them Mm -hmm. and is, by the audio recordings, very much extremely suspicious of the idea of Kurt, that Kurt killed himself, very much thinks it was a murder and a setup, mm-hmm. but then once kind of push comes to shove, well, now Courtney's the one paying her bills, and she kind of backs away from all of that and just kind of lets sleeping dogs lie. So it does, I kind of, I, I think it does show how a murder can be covered up by people who weren't actively involved once there's enough financial interest or you're a heroin addict, there's enough getting more heroin interest in covering it up. Yeah. And so Courtney sent Tom Grant into the house. Yeah, that's a uh, so like, okay, so Kurt Cobain, I, I guess just like this timeline of the end of Kurt's life. Okay, yeah. uh, so March first, nineteen ninety four, does his last show in Munich, Germany. He's diagnosed with bronchitis and laryngitis. He flies to Rome next day for medical treatment. He's joined by Courtney Love in Rome, March third, nineteen ninety four. And this is controversial because after Kurt was dead. Courtney started telling people that Kurt attempted suicide in Rome, but nobody ever said that while he was alive. Right. And uh, so basically, uh, she says, Courtney Love says that Kurt had overdosed on Ruhifnol, champagne and Ruhifnol, uh, Rufinol, uh, on March 4th, 1994. But the thing is, Courtney had brought all that uh, Rufinol from England, where it was legal. She had brought it all there. Uh, so he's rushed to the hospital, he's unconscious. Uh, then after five days, he's released and returns to um, to Seattle. In England, you're allowed to roofie <laughs> the birds, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it nice? If you want to get, if you want to have sex, <laughs> you can buy them at the the drugstore. Um, but the thing is, they contacted like journalists contacted that doctor in Rome uh, for Kurt Cobain's hospitalization there. And Courtney, you know, uh, she says Courtney Love said that starts telling people that Kurt took 60 pills and it was not an accident. It was like an intentional suicide. But the doctor who treated him in Rome was contacted by journalists. He denies that there were 60 pills in his stomach and he says it's an accident. Mm -hmm. So it is just like, it's very weird where either Courtney Love did something to him there or she just started saying it was a suicide to try to reinforce the idea he was suicidal. So she like after he's dead... She starts saying that he tried to kill himself in Rome, but also on April 4th, she files a missing persons report in his mom's name saying that he's suicidal. It just seems like she's like putting all these little little clues right. to try to try to uh, paint things that way. Why did she? F- yeah. What what reason does she give for filing it in her mom's name in his mom's name? She I don't said, think she's yeah. she said that nobody would take it seriously. If like, it oh, Courtney Love says. He's yeah, missing. Drug addict like, yeah. Courtney Love. Yeah, <laughs> nobody took anything she said seriously. So right. She was right. like, well, I put it under his mom's name so that people would believe it. She is, um, she's unbelievable in Man on the Moon, in my opinion. I think she does a great job in the movie Man on the Moon. Okay. Um, but the way she talks about Kurt Cobain in interviews, yeah. especially about why would a guy do that? Yeah. Her answers are so shit. At the very, if she didn't kill him, I'm not saying she killed him. She is very unaware of, like, she's never thought about his emotions into actually why he killed himself. Right. Because she gives the the 
like you never been to therapy reason, which was like he thought that fame was stupid. He hated all those popular guys. Just like you were saying, he shit on all those popular people. Mm -hmm. And he resented that football teams ran out to smells like teen spirit Mm. because he wasn't for the football players. And it's like, yes, you could be annoyed by that. That can bother you to no end. You're not shooting yourself in the face because people who you think are jerks Mm Um, like and, uh, again, now a high schooler, a 14 year old hears that and they go, yeah, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. I don't want the mean kids to like the shit I make. Right. It's for people just like me. No, that that's like a Paul Bunyan story. That's a made up myth. Yeah. That, that's how you like, uh, it's just so bogus. And, yeah. and to, to, per, but what's that word? Perpetuate, perpetuate, uh, perpetuate a myth like that is fucking silly. And you sound like a child talking about your favorite artist, yeah. and not the wife of a man who shot himself. Hmm. Yeah, and that's why I I do like to address that. I really think Kurt Cobain had kid brain. I think Courtney Love still might have kid brain, mm-hmm. and they should have. They were in their twenties and right. drugs and famous. Yeah, they should have absolutely had kid brain. Yeah, but it is just so crazy for her to talk like eleven year old fans talk. Didn't uh, she also say that like he they, had thin skin or something? Every time I see She's her talk about him, it's say. like, did you read a book about Kurt Cobain or did, were you married right. to the married fucking right. guy? Uh-huh. You sound like a mark. You uh-huh. sound like someone who just buys into what the media said about Kurt. It's very weird. Yeah. You go, that's not Kurt. That's like that's like a, an MTV interview you saw. Yeah. Mm. It's weird. Oh, actually, you know, also one of my favorite like grunge albums is by Hole. It's Live Through This. It got released like right after Kurt died. And you know, people allege like Kurt did a bunch of ghost writing for it. I don't, he did like uh, he he played some um, some background guitar on it and such. But uh, but anyways, live through this. Uh, uh, they have that song "Doll Parts." It's a really good song. But she has this. It's about Kurt Cobain. It's um, and she has that uh, that line in it. Uh, Someday you'll ache like I ache, you know, and that like. You know, if you want to get really conspiratorial, you're like, yeah, she's like bragging about how she's going to kill Kurt Cobain in that song. Oh, she's going to get you revenge on Yeah. Him. What's the, it's like, yeah, they really want you. They really want you. I don't you. Know, I don't think, I only know like um, a whole music video. Yeah. Where it, it reminds me of Carrie. I feel like they're at prom. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's all I know about Hole, though. I never really listened. I think Hole's really good, or at least that album is. And then the bass player, um, Kristen uh, Path, I think that's how you pronounce her name. But the bass player who was on that album lived through this. She dies of a heroin overdose June 1994. So just two months after Kurt, she also dies of a heroin overdose, which I think is weird because in that documentary Soaked in Bleach, Tom Grant says that Courtney Love was convinced that Kurt Cobain was having an affair with her. So assuming you buy the Courtney killed Kurt thing, it also seems like, oh, yeah, and then she killed this uh, bass player with the same fake heroin overdose uh, thing uh, that she thought was having an affair with her husband. And then also a fucking Seattle police detective who was looking into where Kurt got the heroin from gets shot to death, which was the first at the time, you know, uh, was the first Seattle police officer killed in the line of duty in nine years from like 1994. Yeah. I believe he dies in 94 or 95. Up until then, that was the first uh, Seattle police officer killed in nine years. Just so happens to be the detective looking into where Kirk got the heroin that he was on the night that he was mm-hmm. was dead. Yeah, because what do Seattle police really have to look into? Like somebody has a llama on their on their property. <laughs> Yeah, this is just, I'm quoting from John Potash. Uh, Seattle police detective Antonio Terry uh, reportedly went against his superior's orders not to investigate Kurt's death as anything but a suicide and investigated the source of heroin in Cobain's body. Someone then murdered Terry, making him the first active duty Seattle police officer to die in nine years. Tom Grant said it was kind of weird because he went to the house like when they were investigating. Yeah. He went to the house and said, I was in the house the day before. Like, I'm like, Courtney Love hired me. I'm a private detective. Mm. And he said that, like, if if um if I was doing that investigation and somebody said somebody said that, I would be like, we have to talk to this guy right now. And if he tries to leave, put him in handcuffs. Right. And don't let him leave. Yeah. Um. So and then there's other investigators that they talked in the documentary and they're like, you know, uh. Well, they seem to rule it was a suicide. Right. Before. Like we said, I, I think we said this on the previous on the free episode, but Seattle police announced it was a suicide the same day Kurt Cobain's body was found, mm-hmm. which is insane. Like you should still have to do forensics and yeah. kind of a basic, you know, 
we found Kurt Cobain's body. Circumstances of death unclear. There was a shotgun there. Yeah, he was on hair. But we're gonna invent. But just to announce it the same day, and uh, to not develop the crime scene photos for twenty years, to yeah. um, not do fingerprints on the shotgun. To do you think that's because cops are lazy? There's probably that element of it. Yes. Yeah. I mean, like there was that video that emerged uh, in Columbus, and like a guy called the cops because his daughter sent a lewd photo to like an adult, and the cops show up, and the cops like she could probably get charged with child porn. Yeah, he's he like, like she's you, eleven, yeah, she's right? 11. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, and he's and like, like, yeah, but she took the pic, and they're yeah. like, yeah, they just don't know their fucking jobs. I'm just like, but law. I'm like, I bet it's easier to uh, like charge an 11 year old with child pornography there's probably some law that says like you don't have to do as much paperwork if you charge the 11 year old yeah oh, you know what yeah. i mean than to like go and find a, a grown guy they're like oh we got the getting the child porn off the streets one 11 year old at a time <laughs> but um okay so the the incident in rome happens mm-hmm. kurt you know ods which courtney love would later say is a suicide and then in los angeles in march 30th 1994 kurt checks into a rehab facility or a detox facility, but then he checks out the next day. But the um, uh, the Soaked in Bleach documentary makes a couple points, which is one, while Kurt was in the rehab, Courtney Love called him 13 times, and he didn't answer any of the calls. Mm-hmm. Like, she tried to reach him again and again, he never answered. And then the next day, he flies to Seattle without Courtney Love. Like, she's within a 10-mile radius. Like, it seems clear from all the evidence that he just wanted to get away from this lady. Mm-hmm. And... Um, <clears throat> And so he flies to Seattle, and he's found dead in his uh, in his Seattle residence. But the thing is, this is very disturbing to me. This guy, Michael Cali du- uh, Dwight, uh, do it, I guess. Michael Cali do it. Uh, he was the live-in nanny for their daughter Frances. So he was living at the Seattle home where Kurt was found dead at. Like Kurt was found dead in the the greenhouse. Like they had a biggish property. You know, they were rich. Kurt was found dead in the greenhouse, but this guy, Michael Kelly Dewitt, was uh, the living nanny. He was living there, and he was there from, like, at least from April 3rd up until Kurt's body was found there, just watching the place. And one of the weirder things is, like you were saying, Tom Grant, the private uh, investigator, he go- he flies up to Seattle April 6th. And he goes through the house a couple times. He doesn't find Kurt's body because it's on this this greenhouse in a different part of the property. Yeah. But he goes through the house a couple times because he Courtney tells him to go there and look for the shotgun. And like one I, one of the maybe the second time he goes through there, he says that he finds a note that's left there that Callie apparently wrote to like leave for Kurt. But it's the most absurd note you would ever hear, where it's like um something like. Kurt, I know you were here. I can't. I don't know how I missed you or something, but you need to call Courtney and be more responsible or something like that. Yeah. And you know, he even, um, uh, uh, he even t- Tom Grant even talks to the the lawyer we keep mentioning, Rosemary Carroll, and has a recording of this conversation about the note with her on the phone, where she's like, "Yeah, it seems like he left that because he already knew what happened to Kurt. Like he already knew Kurt was dead, and he mm-hmm. left that note to try to like." leave a paper trail and it said it didn't sound sincere it doesn't sound sincere it and sounds like one of the notes you find in like a resident evil game it's like people yeah don't, people uh-huh. don't write like this uh-huh. and it just so happens michael cali do it is one of the last people i believe the last person to see kurt alive he sees him on april 2nd kurt hangs out with him and his girlfriend and also weirdly i just found this from wikipedia uh in 2016 uh do it created the merchandise for kanye west life of pablo tour mm-hmm. oh wow I, I like that merchandise yeah Damn. Yeah. He got Damn. the he got the inspiration from the patterns when he blew Kurt Cobain's head off. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah, and it's like oh this it's just a na- he a male nanny and it was the male nanny dude? just so happens he's a longtime friend of Courtney Love and her ex boyfriend. So right. who do you want to kill Kurt for you? I mean the guy who lives on the property, knows him, is your ex boyfriend. You know, you probably just break him a couple million off that two hundred million. I'm sure you would keep a secret, right? And then you get to get to fuck your ex again. I mean, yeah. After you kill Kurt right, Cobain right. together, yeah. I'm sure that's yeah way better than breakup sex. She's <laughs> like, how would you like to make seven thousand dollars? <laughs> 
Unfortunately, the the hero the heroin use by everybody in like a yes. mile radius right. ruins the whole story. Where sure. it's just like, and then his heroin addict friend Steve was also there, <laughs> yeah, and then yeah, heroin yeah. Greg showed up. <laughs> yeah, like, what the yeah, fuck? Yeah, 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 <laughs> and like everyone's story, yeah, yeah, no yeah, one's yeah. story adds up, and they weren't thinking straight. Right. I did watch sort of a, a a debunked video, and one thing that the guy brings up is that like, you know, he this suicide is not. It's not a decision made by a rational person, mm-hmm. so you can't really expect. Yeah, people him to go. Be he bought it for protection. It's like that's what people say when they buy a gun. Yeah. We're, hey, what are you buying a gun for? Oh, I want to shoot myself in the face. Yeah, yeah. You say, oh, why else would I buy a gun? Yeah. To protect myself. Yeah. I guess it makes sense if he was like super isolated and didn't, you know, because all his friends were like, oh, he was, he would never. Uh, commit suicide but yeah. Yeah. well people also say you he know never he knew. was they said he took enough heroin where it would kill someone right, right. so why not just <clears throat> overdose on heroin then there's the argument he was a heroin addict mm-hmm. he he of course he could live and walk around with that much heroin in him so you're judging it going oh it looked like he would have o- od'd on this no he was walking around like that because he's a heroin but that's like okay so there's this toxicology report and like a typical heroin injection is about 40 milligrams He's got yeah. 225 milligrams of heroin in his in his system, and this is, uh, according to most everything I've read, this is about three times the amount that would be lethal for even an experienced heroin user. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, so the the idea is he shot up 225 milligrams of heroin, which would be a lethal dose for even a, uh, an experienced user. He shoots up a lethal dose, then he cleanly puts his needle away back in its you know container case, and you blows his brains out with a shotgun. Right. And the the point the documentary makes repeatedly is essentially there is no evidence of anyone anywhere on earth being mm-hmm. functional enough uh-huh. to operate a shotgun or even just do anything on 225 milligrams of heroin if it didn't just kill you but that's you thing, would certainly te- just be knocked out. They don't test these drugs on people. They don't give people much heroin and then go, "All right, now do chores." So they can't they don't That's they what don't we know. need. No, I think this is know. what we need for Mythbusters. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just see if see if see if you can get somebody to do chores after they shoot up two twenty five milligrams. They go. They said no man could pick up a gun like after doing that. Just the guy, the guy with the the guy with the curly mustache just falling on somebody on the F train. (laughs) Every every debunk video that I watched Mm -hmm. uh, spent the entire time doing this like this JFK like bullet angle thing Uh where it's like, well, the the shotgun. Uh, actually could have been positioned that way uh, if yeah. it bounced off his knee it's like who cares like yeah. who are, you're not going to convince anybody they, they all ignore the most damning part of what tom grant has to offer which is his audio recordings with courtney love right and her and they none of them address mm-hmm. that she's uh, sometimes giddy when she's talking about her missing husband mm-hmm. yeah and then didn't she Say that like she found. The, doesn't she tell Tom Grant that she found the letter in the house under her pillow, which he'd already checked? Yeah, the night before he went there and he checked under the pillows, under the mattress. He found she, he found drugs under the mattress. That's how well he checked the bed. So mm-hmm. he didn't find that note. And he has an audio recording where he's talking to her, saying, "No, Courtney, like that letter was not there." And she's like, "Uh, uh, uh, yeah." Uh, yeah. Uh, and she also, Courtney Love, after Kurt's dead, she starts leaking parts of his suicide note to the press, including lines that are not actually in it. Yeah. She leaks a line to uh-huh. Us magazine that says, quote, I can't live my life like this any longer, saying that this was in Kurt's suicide note. It wasn't. Yeah. You know, or, you know, it's not fun for me anymore. She just has like a bunch of weird lies and weird behaviors, both before and after the, the body is found. Right. Um, But yeah. It's, uh, I don't know. I think, um, oh, I guess we should also mention this documentary, Kurt and Courtney. Uh, it's by this British director named uh, Nick Broomfield. Uh, and he mostly kind of comes to the conclusion that, yes, the official story is accurate. Kurt killed himself. Mm-hmm. But also Courtney's a liar who tries to, like, suppress free speech or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but he actually... It's interesting he comes to that conclusion because in that documentary, he has an interview with the lead singer of um, The Mentors, who's El Duce, Mm -hmm. uh, El Duce, and he says on camera in this documentary, El Duce does, that Courtney Love offered him $50,000 to kill Kurt Cobain. Yeah. And uh, he says, 
Uh, he claimed in the film that he knew who killed Cobain, but that what a he, cheapskate! <laughs> Fifty thousand, yeah, <laughs> for two hundred million. Yeah, payout. yeah. It translates to the douche, I think. Yeah, fifty is enough. But um, he says El Duce says in the film that he knew who killed Cobain, but quote he would let the FBI catch him. Eight days after the interview was filmed. El Duce was killed when he was hit by a what? train. What? Yes. It is funny. Fucking Courtney train, Love dude. does have like Clinton body count, where it's like yeah. det- Seattle detective looking into the heroin, dead. Yeah. El Duce gives the interview, dead by a train eight days later. Uh, Kristen Paff, the bassist from Hole, dead of a heroin overdose, June 1994. Why didn't she kill Tom Grant? Uh, that's a good question. Try. Well, it's also. But she it, never sued him, right? That's the other thing. Yeah. It's like she's sent. Courtney Love has sent a lot of cease and desist letters, but she's never sued anybody over saying she killed Kurt Cobain. And mm-hmm. it's like, why wouldn't she sue for defamation? Mm-hmm. Oh, because you get exposed to discovery. Right. And a whole bunch of things might happen there. Right. Grant is like the Dr. Loomis to her Michael Myers. He ha- He's the only one right. who survives. Right. You right. Know? Um, apparently, the uh, another allegation is that Alan Wrench, another an LA singer of his the name band, is Alan. Oh yeah, okay, it's a band member. The That's band not kill his name. I was like, kill what? Alan Wrench. Uh, yeah, El Duce might have said at one point that Alan Wrench of the uh, band Kill Alan Wrench took Love's offer to kill Cobain. And it um, this is John Potash says that when El Duce was found dead, the last person seen with him the night of his death was Alan Wrench. Mm. When he was hit by a train, she was just gonna keep asking uh, more singers. So she, Fred Durst, was next <laughs> on her list. <laughs> but good thing somebody took her up on it. That's so crazy. Yeah, I wonder what Dave Grohl and Chris think. He about was it. hit by a train. So what did? So did she have like superhuman strength or something? She threw him in front of a train. I Who assume gets hit he by was, a fucking train. He was by probably the way. killed right. and left on the tracks. Right. Hmm. I was trying to see the last person to actually see Kurt, but I think it you is. You don't think Cal- she's going to kill us, do you? No, probably not. It's probably like a pizza delivery guy or something. He's the last person to see Kurt. I mean, it's like when I'm being like fully, let's see, when I'm being basic, like I don't want to come off like a conspiracy theorist or whatever. Mm-hmm. What I would say to people is in any husband wife murder, mm-hmm. the first suspect sure. is the husband or wife, the sure. spouse, sure. especially when there's 200 million on the line. Right. Does not seem like that angle was investigated at all, especially if Seattle police announced it's a suicide the same day they found the body. Yeah. So that's what I would say if I was just like being reasonable, I don't want to be called a conspiracy theorist. Yeah. But what I would say if I've, you know, drank in half of an 8.6% <laughs> imperial pumpkin <laughs> ale, <laughs> Uh, How is that beer, by the way? It's, I like, it's I pretty good. It. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't... You know, pumpkin beer is very hard to do right. Dogfish yeah. Head does a really good one, mm-hmm. but, like, vast majority of the time is too sweet. Yeah. But this is actually a pretty decent uh, okay, pumpkin good. beer. This is the Southern Tier Brewing Co. Good, good. But anyways, so if I had drank such a pumpkin beer and I was just hanging out with my friends, what I would say is, yeah, Courtney Love is at the next... Not necessarily at the Nexus, but she is a node in some sort of intelligence network. Where, you know, whether probably CIA linked, maybe the Mossad, who knows, but essentially just the fact that she kind of shows up where, you know, her dad makes this allegation that she was kind of pimped out to a CIA guy. She's bringing drugs to all these different scenes. She's circled in Jeffrey Epstein's black book, and Jeffrey Epstein was, I think the evidence shows, an intelligence asset blackmailing people. Uh And the fact also on the Comedy Central roast, she knew about how Harvey Weinstein. I think she's just somebody who's like knows where a lot of the bodies are buried in terms of sexual blackmail. Right. And I think sexual blackmail is a very important part of intelligence uh, agencies in the modern world. I think if you sexually blackmail somebody, you control them. It's very important to be able to do that to politicians, but also just yeah. celebrities, influential people. It's got to be so annoying too. You're like, God, I had sex with one 17, 17 year old, and now you just this Jeffrey Epstein just owns me forever. But so it's like it's one of those things where I don't necessarily buy that, you know, the CIA Kurt kill, killed Kurt Cobain because he's such a threat or, mm-hmm. you know, his music would have changed the world or whatever. But I could see like when you're talking about 200 million. Yeah. yeah. A lot of these intelligence networks are they're basically organized crime. Yeah. It's just like any fucking robbery in The Sopranos. Yeah. yeah. You have a chance to get 200 million from Kurt Cobain and Courtney Love ri- runs in circles that are powerful enough to have any sort of investigation to the murder squashed because, as we were mentioning, you know, the Seattle Police Department, they have an intelligence division. They interface with the CIA. If somebody tells their detectives, hey, this is a CIA, FBI, whatever matter, yeah, they're not going to do anything. 
you know, and just so happens one of those Seattle police detectives ends up murdered. Mm -hmm. Do you remember Courtney on the uh, Pam Anderson road? Yeah, I was just thinking about that. Yeah, she was she was too fucked up to talk. She was super fucked up, and and that was a bummer. I remember that because she was like sober for a minute. Um, but on the red carpet, she right. she shits on Harvey Weinstein. And that's what I was saying yeah. is like she's one of those people who knew about Harvey Weinstein in advance. And again, it was an open secret, but I guess it was kind of an open secret that he cast and couched. It wasn't necessarily she like said, that. Yeah, she basically said my advi- advice to women is don't take a meeting with, with Harvey Weinstein. Weinstein. Yeah. yeah. So it's like she knew enough about his M.O. at the time that it makes me think that she's plugged into a network of sexual blackmail. And the fact that she was circled in. Jeffrey Epstein's black book very much makes me think that. Um, yeah, talented musician, but definitely involved in CIA pedophile blackmail. I think we can. I think we can say that. Pretty I think we can all say that. I think Just we can definitive. say. You know, like not every listener, not every yeah. listener will agree with all of my conclusions this episode, but yeah. I think this one will not go <laughs> yeah. challenged. And you know who else is involved in CIA pedophile blackmail is Tony Hinchcliffe. Folks. I always got a vibe. <clears throat> the other thing like uh, the thing about this documentary too is that like you look up the reviews and like what's it score on Rotten Tomatoes and everything and it's you know it's bad but every criticism of the documentary is about the reenactments and not about like mm-hmm. the evidence in the documentary itself mm-hmm. there's even a, there's a clip of Joe Rogan uh, talking to the guy from Smashing Pumpkins saying, like, it should be illegal what he did in this documentary, doing these reenactments, you're putting words in people's mouths. It's like, yeah, but it, sh- he's cutting in the real audio uh, right. files, like, during this. Well, you you want to try to get someone to sit. H- how would the reviews have been if you had a movie where you sit down and you just look at a blank screen and it transcribes you know, mm-hmm. hours of, or, you know, 20 minutes of audio files. Like, yeah, you yeah. have to do something to make people want to watch it. So all those yeah. reenactments are, uh, tra- like, they're transcribed. It's, uh, like, it'll cut in at random parts with the actual audio file to remind you that you're watching something that he has taped on mm-hmm. record mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. that it's not just something that was written right, know, right. out of fiction. Right. Did he, you know, condense... Maybe a forty-five minute conversation into a five right, minute right. conversation and take some liberties, probably. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. He there's a because in the beginning he's like you know Courtney's like I found this note and he's like well the problem with that is I I searched the house already and she was like oh well it was in there and he was like all right if you say so yeah he's like I'm gonna tell you what I've been telling you this whole time Courtney if you say so yeah yep. yeah. Yeah, the lawyer, Rosemary Carroll, she found, like, doodles in Courtney's stuff. Courtney loves stuff that she leaves with. Again, they share this entertainment lawyer. Uh, In Courtney's things that were left with her on April 6th, she finds, like, doodles of somebody going through Kurt's notebook and tracing, like, Uh trying to trace how he he writes. Uh And so that's, like, one of the things where it seems very... It seems to me very obvious that the Kurt Cobain suicide note was somebody... You know, and again, this is even what uh, Rosemary Carroll said that it's a pistache of things Kurt had actually written in his journal. And then at the very end, the very bottom, you see these like three sentences that yeah. are es- essentially like saying goodbye, everyone will be happier. So, you know, I love you, Francis, et cetera. It, and it seems in like a completely different handwriting. And, ver- and it's, it's written in a very cliche way, mm-hmm. kind of like you were saying earlier about how she talks uh, about Kurt. It's like, you're talking about like somebody who watched an interview or heard somebody talk about it. The last couple lines of that suicide note aren't, I mean, this is one of the most poetic, you know, men that, you know, at the time. And so he's going to be like, you'll be better off without me. Yeah. It's just like, it's very like cliche. Yeah, There's no real explanation. There's no art to it, which right. the, the man, if it was else, on heroin though. Artists. Yeah. It's like, yeah. it's like if, if so it might've been good. If Mike Racine like uh, dies and you find a suicide note where he's like thanking Deborah, then you know he was actually <laughs> murdered and it's fake. If <laughs> <laughs> he's not like complaining about her in the suicide note, <laughs> thank yeah. you for coming into my life. My God, they killed Mike. <laughs> <laughs> That's my beautiful wife <laughs> that I love so much. Um, it, yeah, it's not written in crayon, Deb. <laughs> <laughs> Also, I have a note that looks just like that from when I was 13 years old 
learning how to forge my mom's signature because I <laughs> missed my homework too many right, days. Right, right, yeah. Like right, I've right. seen that piece of paper before. Yeah. yeah, I know what that is. That, but you don't think it's just maybe he was like on drugs or something, and the writing was different. And his something was going on, and maybe he wrote part of the note when he was sober, and then oh, all things are possible. Uh, yeah, is it? Is it? I, I guess my question is: Is it that stark? Is the handwriting that starkly different? Yeah, if you look at it, I mean... It's bigger, the writing is different. I think more importantly, the content is different. Like, yeah. if you mm -hmm. read the suicide note, it doesn't read at all as a suicide note mm -hmm. until the part that also looks different also sounds different. It's uh -huh. like too much, uh -huh. too much difference there to uh -huh. make sense. Yeah. Yeah, it looks pretty... You just see it kind of there at the bottom. Um, yeah, look, if you're fucking... Like, he has, like, things that he he X'd out and that Just stuff, this? Unless just it was this, Courtney? This, at the bottom, just this? That's the only part that's, like, explicitly a suicide note. Yeah. The rest of it is kind of like a pistache of Yeah. People things. say it's a breakup letter to his band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Some people are like, oh, it was him saying goodbye to the music industry. He yeah. didn't want to make songs anymore. He's going to break up with the band, or he's going to... Yeah. Oh, yeah. my God. <laughs> but, this uh, is pretty lucky. Like, you're going through his stuff. You're like, I could turn this into, this into a suicide note. <laughs> yeah. I guess this it's everything he writes enough. sounds like... Where's the white out? Note. Yeah. Well, because I, I watched, like, most of Soaked in Bleach, and I and then I watch, But then I also watch, like, a debunking video. Yeah. So, you know, what the guy says in the debunking video, it's like, this is a guy who, yeah, he was on drugs. But, see, this is like... it it Yeah, it doesn't really look like the same handwriting, though. No. You know what I mean? Like handwriting is pretty distinct. Mm. Like you get a feel for who somebody is with their handwriting. Yeah. And uh yeah, this is like this handwriting is much uh it's much more rounder, the 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 vowels are much more open. Yeah. Um it's but yeah, Kurt Cobain was cremated six days after his death, which is a little suspicious. But the only other thing mm -hmm. I just wanted to say is uh we mentioned uh, Cyril Wright on the Sam Cooke episode, mm -hmm. who he buys the official story with Sam Cooke, but he he does think Kurt Cobain's death. Well, I'll just I'm quoting from John Potash here. After analyzing all the evidence around Kurt Cobain's death, Cyril Wright, MD, a former president of the American Academy of Forensic Science. Mm -hmm. And again, this is like Cyril Wright is not a guy you can dismiss as like a crank podcaster. Right. He's an actual sure. expert. Again, former president of the American Academy of Forensic Science. Well, people it, will dismiss us at their own peril, I think. <laughs> but anyways, this uh, this eminently qualified former president of the American Academy of Forensic Science, he tells CBS Channel 2 News in Pittsburgh that he saw, thought Cobain's death was, quote, a homicide and, quote, a staged suicide. Uh, Cyril Wright first described how there was enough heroin in, in Cobain to kill five people. Uh, police claim Cobain then had the time to put his syringe and his other per paraphernalia away neatly in a box mm -hmm. before picking up the shotgun, which uh, White uh, Wright said uh, was, quote, highly unlikely since such a large dose of heroin incapacitates people in seconds. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, generally, yeah. I don't I don't know. I mean, I know people think I just say like CIA everything or every episode I do is just. CIA conspiracy, but I really mm -hmm. try not to believe in these things. I really try right. to just do my best to just accept. You know, I want to yeah. take the blue pill. But I you want, read a lot, so I want I want to taste the steak in my mouth yeah. and not know that the Matrix is making a computer program that gives me the flavor. <laughs> That's my dream in life. Yeah, and I try my best with every story. I'm like, hit yeah. me with all your debunker shit. Yeah, but I think like in the case of Kurt Cobain i think he was murdered and it doesn't have to be as crazy as like a big cia it's just as simple as like oh there's 200 million dollars yeah. and courtney love ran with some organized crime people and yeah. when there's a uh, when there's a score like that you know powerful people uh you can get some things done and you pay off the right people you can uh, get a uh, murder investigation squashed pretty quick if you tell me that the people who made king <laughs> and queens are connected to the cia i might i might end my life there's got to be some good left in this world. <laughs> yeah. But um, I guess that's all I wanted to say for the uh, the evidence. But do we have any other thoughts on uh, Kurt Cobain, Nirvana generally? When I Somebody said on Reddit, they were like, imagine your, your dad's friends come over every week to have schizophrenic conversations about the CIA. <laughs> <laughs> How everything's a conspiracy. <laughs> and then he goes, what an awesome childhood. <laughs> 
when I was in middle school, we rode bikes over to my buddy Chris's house, and uh, we went into his room, and he had black underneath his eyes, mm -hmm. and we were like, what the fuck happened under your eyes? Mm -hmm. And it was very obvious to all of us it was makeup. Mm -hmm. And since he just knew we noticed something under his eyes, mm -hmm. he said that he got into a fight. Uh -huh. And we were like, what happened? Like, we were like, what, yeah. what happened? Would you get in a fight with Al Jolson? Dude, he was trying to, like, act like his dad beat him up. And we're like, what? <laughs> yeah. And then uh, we remember. He's like, Justin Trudeau he, kicked my ass. Dude, the computer, like, this, you know, the it, it, the screen was on or whatever. That Like, someone hit the mouse while we were all talking. And yeah. it was a picture of Kurt Cobain with, like, black makeup under his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> he was trying to do Kurt Cobain makeup <laughs> under his eyes. Uh -huh. And then he said his dad punched him <laughs> in the eyes. Punched we're like, what? Is it? it looked like makeup. Yeah, and it was makeup because you were trying to be like Kurt, and I think a lot of people were trying to be a like Kurt. A lot of people were trying to be like, yeah. especially those sixty-eight people who killed themselves. Right. Yeah. yeah. So if d if you want to be like Kurt, don't kill yourself. Mm. Just get murdered by the mafia. Yeah. And if you want to be like us, oh wait, we're all do already doing the Patreon. <laughs> I was going to try to plug the Patreon. <laughs> get your friends to subscribe. Yeah. Yeah. Get your friends. Yeah. To get subscribe. your friends to subscribe. Come yeah. on. If Please. you if you if you have somebody who's like a victim of sexual blackmail who you're mm -hmm. controlling, you <laughs> should make them subscribe to the Patreon. Exactly. If you are Courtney Love the and you run, a, tier. you run a network of uh, blackmailed pedophiles, yeah, you should get them to subscribe to the Patreon. Yeah. And if you want to update your subscription to fifty dollars a month, you can hang out with us at a bar a block away from my house. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure <laughs> if, how great of an idea that is. <laughs> the, uh, we're going to make sure that you leave before us so you don't follow me home, obviously. We're gonna well, that's a, pretty good, that's a pretty big upgrade. We used to do the $50, which we would just have a phone call with you, which yeah. we wouldn't even do that. We couldn't even do and a now, phone call. Now three now of us have to meet up at a that bar. We're going to physically no, meet up with people for I'll $50. It. I'll do it. I'll do Johnny it. Johnny thinks that we could just do it after we record one night. Yeah, yeah. But they we'll would have, have to be in the, the New York area. Well, yeah. We're yeah. Helping them. Well, they don't have to. I mean, if they have a car, <laughs> yeah, if they want to fly, if they want to hang out with us, bad hey, enough. If they want to yeah. stay at Mike's, <laughs> <laughs> fifty dollars. Stay. Could you imagine that? You get to stay at somebody Mike's pays for the weekend. <laughs> somebody pays. Somebody come visit New York. <laughs> somebody pays four hundred dollars on a flight <laughs> and to hang out with us for like twenty minutes. We're like, all right, man, enjoy the city. Uh, Maybe check out Joe's Pizzeria. Bye bye. Yeah. <laughs> Subscribe to Mike's Airbnb. Yeah. <laughs> Little do they know they will run into Mike at Joe's Pizza later that night. <laughs> oh no, you again? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> <laughs> All right. There will be some other good uh, I incentives for those tiers too. Yeah. Besides yeah. that, so for we'll, sure. we'll post those soon. So look out yeah. for those. And it's been a pleasure. Any final thoughts? Oh, I guess we want to just say a sh little shout out to our 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 friend Matt Kreisman, uh, wishing you. The best. Congrats on the birth of your kids. Oh, okay. Sorry yeah, that Twitter is uh, full of freaks uh, who say all kinds of horrible stuff. I saw a tweet today, and the, and this guy said that uh, this guy said that the Chapo Trap House is the reason that we lost the courts. Mm, so which true. is so it's so great. I just imagine, yeah, because it's like there's the one there's like the Democrat, like you know Hillary lovers mm -hmm. who who say Matt Kreisman put Trump in office. Yeah, but then there's the reactionaries who're like Matt Kreisman is flooding white nations with brown yeah, people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like wow. I wonder if these people realize they're on the same side yet. Right. Matt Got convinced all the right RPG enemies. not to retire in 2013. <laughs> Literally, like, like you, your brain made the thought that we don't have the Supreme Court because of a fucking podcast. Yeah, and then you type that out and hit send. Not because of a racist old hag who yeah. refused to step down under a black president. Yeah, yeah. Fuck you, RBG. <laughs> racist <laughs> bitch, <laughs> granny. <laughs> yeah. Um. Even if, but even if she did step down, we still would have. There, they. They would still have a majority, right? What, what, do, we what, get, what do we? What a what joke! The Supreme into? Court is okay. Now let's. If RBG uh -huh. <laughs> retired during yes. Obama, yeah, 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 but she didn't because she liked the memes too much. That's what I heard. She she would have been replaced an old by retard. a liberal. Yeah, and we wouldn't have gotten that beautiful moment where Trump pretends to find out that she's dead. Exactly. Which yeah. is which <laughs> is more <laughs> that <laughs> moment is more important than the court. Are you kidding me? That's true. Johnny is such like a, a burn it down kind of guy. You got to respect it. Mm. That moment, yeah, Ellen John's playing in the background, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The hands. When he puts so the hands wild. up. She lived a great ready? life. <laughs> Whatever you think. Baby. Agree or disagree, <laughs> she had an incredible life. Lady.
<laughs> he has <laughs> he, sad of a You're telling me for the first time. <laughs> I'm just hearing this. You're I'm telling just, me for the first time. Wow. That was kind of the first time. He has this new thing he does now when he lies where he goes, okay, ready? And then he puts his hands <laughs> up and then, he, and then he recites the lie. That was yeah. kind of like his first. That was like when he discovered doing that. Yeah. Yeah. But even if she retired and Obama appointed somebody, we would have, it would be four, it would still be four to five, right? It'd be a five, four majority. Wasn't this a tribute to Matt Chrisman like three minutes ago when you started talking? I just want to ask a question. No, I'm sorry. No, but wouldn't it be four, wouldn't it be five to four? If, I don't no, but it was um, a, a liberal would have been replaced with a liberal instead of a conservative. Yes. I'm, I don't know what the numbers. But, but it was when fi- they got Kavanaugh in. But yeah. it would have been a younger liberal and they would have lived long and then we wouldn't have been in the right. situation yeah, yeah. we were in with Trump. Yes. Yeah. But it was like um, when they, they got Kavanaugh, yeah, there was right. a five four that was that gave but it them was five a, four majority. But they yeah, right? they called it the Kennedy Court because it was uh, Anthony Kennedy was yeah. still supporting abortion rights, like you know they overturned Citizens United and all that. But they is mm-hmm. that one of the Kennedys? Uh, I don't think he's like related to the Kennedy Kennedy family, hmm. but um, he's related to Jamie Kennedy. <laughs> yes, but anyways, the point is that was a conservative court, but it had upheld abortion rights. The idea is we would still mm-hmm. have a. Uh, Still have abortion if um, hmm. Anthony Kennedy, yes. He was the, they called him the swing vote on that 5 4 court. They, oh, you know, okay. he gave the election to George W. Bush in 2000. Yeah. He was part of a, he's so like a wild card. Yeah. Yeah. Like every court, like, has the wild card who, like, sometimes votes with the liberals, sometimes yeah. votes with the conservatives. Yeah. And at that point, it was Anthony Kennedy. So it was like already a conservative court, but he had oh, up, yeah. He had upheld abortion rights. Yeah. And it wasn't until they got rid of RBG and replaced her with a conservative yeah. that there was enough to mm-hmm. get rid of abortion. So we'd, now, have a mo- can, we'd have a more moderate conservative court. Can, basically. Can Biden get Sotomayor and Kagan to retire and then replace them with like two 21 year olds? <laughs> like two Gen Z? Like just the most annoying. <laughs> you That'd know? be awesome. Yeah. Non binary. Yeah. Just mm. the most like whatever. That, that girl with the short hair who screamed in her car about. Uh, Trump being a fascist. Yeah. yeah. But we're wishing well to Matt Chrisman, and we know he'll be back out there diluting white nations soon. Yeah. Making sure they're flooded with uh, with with black and brown bodies, mm-hmm. destroying the white race. Yeah. And as destroying you the Supreme Court, <laughs> just tearing apart the fabric of this nation with your, we, we know with your podcast, podcast that doesn't even do video. <laughs> we know your two greatest passions are destroying the white they don't race. Need, they're not even on YouTube. <laughs> destroying the white race and making sure Trump gets reelected uh, exactly. in 2024. Exactly. Those are the two things that he has devoted his life exactly. to. And Guys, when we all vote for Trump in a few months, let's do it for Matt Chrisman, baby. Oh, Everybody, yeah. if you're watching this at home, Matt Chrisman wants you to vote for Donald Trump in 2024. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's part of destroying the white race. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Um, We'll see you next week. All right. Bye-bye.